Yeah, talking tax with Tom Yamachika. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're going to talk about ending government by fiat this morning, namely the emergency proclamations that David Ige has issued again and again and again during our time together in COVID. Welcome to the show, Tom. Welcome, Jay. Uh, glad to be here. I want to tell you a story, and then you can work off that. So yesterday I was online um, in Long's at the pharmacy counter, and um, I thought I'd chat the guy up who was behind me in line. I noticed that he had his mask. He had a mask because you can't get in without a mask, but he had his mask down, way down, and nobody, nobody really noticed that. And he was walking around Long's without, without really without a mask. So I said to him, uh, you know, my my uh, my concern about um, um, the attempt to link vaccination um, funding um, to continuing the government, which has been threatened, which was threatened yesterday. And um, it launched him off into a, a kind of tirade. Uh, he said, uh, you know, I'm here to get my my covid vaccination, but I don't want to. I don't think I have to. It should be voluntary. And it's involuntary because I'm taking a flight and they're making me come down here and take my vaccination shot. Um, and um, otherwise, I would not do that. If, if it was voluntary, truly voluntary, I would not do that. And uh, I looked at him. I looked at the mask all slipped down on his face. He was only a few feet away. and. I could do nothing else but turn around. And I turned around and I disengaged the conversation. Now, suffice to say, there was somebody in that store getting a shot, getting a vaccine, who was so angry he could not hold himself. And, and, and it struck me, and this is a central point for our discussion today, that he probably had no clue about Omicron. He probably had no clue about the numbers. He probably had no clue about the people he could be infecting in the store because he was not vaccinated at all, walking around with half a mask um, and in other places. So, you know, my, my reaction as I turned my back on him was, um, gee whiz, um, this is not good. And this happens right here at home. So my question to you about David Ige and his proclamations, if there were legal issues before Tom, uh, if David Ige was exceeding the, the boundaries of what would be um, an appropriate proclamation, an emergency proclamation, um, the boundaries of extending and renewing that proclamation for two years now, um, doesn't that change now with Omicron? Well, here's the thing um, we have now. Uh, had about a year and a half of chained emergency proclamations. Emergency proclamations are supposed to last only 60 days. Okay. But if on the 59th day, the governor says, well, we still have an emergency, uh, then you can make another emergency proclamation and then we start the clock over. So this has been done again and again and again. Uh, we've gotten, we got to the 21st, um, emergency proclamation uh, related to the COVID-19 emergency in June. And then I guess they, they, they uh, thought that uh, 21 was uh, a good enough number. So they started, it, so, so the next proclamation in the series was titled something else. It was the emergency proclamation related to the state's COVID-19 Delta response. Okay, and they can, they can start the numbering over again. So, so we, you know, you and I don't have to realize that this is the twenty-second or more in a series of, of uh, you know, chained emergency events. Okay, now um, that uh, I think raises some questions in and of itself. Okay, as to whether the emergency power statutes are being, you know, used for the purposes indicated or if something else is, is really a, a better answer for this. Um, but I mean, and, and, and it kind of gets back to you know, the, the, the situation that you experienced uh, is I think another 
uh, a related issue, and that is, okay, so if we have an emergency, does society uh, have the right to uh, abridge your freedoms, whatever you know, whatever you think freedoms are? Uh, and and I, I think the answer is well, yes, in in uh, uh, to an extent, because yes, you don't want um, this this person, you know, uh, with with the with the mask half off, infecting everybody in the store, uh, and that's precisely what happened. Um, uh, when tuberculosis was going around several years ago, and you know they uh, they put in several uh, public health restrictions, including some that last to this day. So I mean, if you uh, are a student and you want to en enroll in our elementary schools or in the University of Hawaii, you got to present a TB test uh, showing that you're negative or that you've been vaccinated against TB. I think or, or both, um, and. Uh, those have been challenged before and they've been held constitution. Okay. But what, uh, what I have a problem with is when you suspend, you know, entire chapters of the Hawaii revised statutes. You know, let's you, let's, let's you... break that down. You know, we have, you and I have talked about that before. Um, and so I think there's two, there's two things on the table here. Um, see if you agree with me. One is um, the, those kinds of things having direct connection with COVID and with the welfare of others and the community uh, and the economy for that matter. Okay, Th Those things where you say to yourself, gee, if the governor doesn't do this, um, we, are, we are going to have more cases, more deaths, and the economy will be undermined and whether people realize it or not, they and their families will be adversely affected directly or sometimes indirectly. Okay, that's one category of proclamation statements uh, on the table. The other category is the category that you and I have talked about before, which you just referred to, where David Ige has said, look, let's just knock out this chapter. We're going to suspend the whole chapter. And that's harder to understand, isn't it? So if I were, if I were questioning um, the law as he interprets it, I would certainly go for that second category. So what are you doing? You know, we didn't, we didn't adopt that chapter lightly. It's been in the law for 20, 30 years, whatever it's been. And it helps us run, you know, the state. I make a distinction. Do you make a distinction? Oh, there's there's definitely a distinction, and even the law makes uh, for a distinction. I mean, the the, the law uh, empowers the government to suspend any law that impedes or tends to impede or be detrimental to the ex expeditious and efficient ex execution of or to conflict with emergency functions. Okay, so like for example, um, if if you need doctors um, in the state more than more than we have. And then, you know, some, somebody from the Department of Health, you know, kind of raises his hand and says, well, uh, these doctors aren't licensed in our state. Um, the governor has, I think, every right to say, well, you know, heck with that. Uh, we need them here. We need them to help, uh, you know, care for uh, the people who are sick because of this emergency. And that I can, I can, I can entirely understand. Okay. But when, when the governor comes up and says, okay, uh, we are going to uh, shut off the uh, pipeline of money to the counties, which is something that he did, I think, in, in um, May of 2020. Um, well, what does that have to do with emergency functions? Yeah, it's hard to find a connection there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very hard. So what would he um, say? What would he say, Tom? If he were here with us today and we, and we put that to him, so why did you do that? cut off the funding for the counties. They need the money, they're entitled, you know, uh, uh, under the law as it existed before you did this proclamation. Um, what's your reason for doing that? Would he have any reason at all? Uh, I think he would say we need the money too. Uh, we, we had a, we're facing a, a severe depletion of state resources and we need money to carry out emergency functions. We, we need the money more than the counties do. Our, our emer this sounds like something out of Animal Farm. 
Um, so all animals are equal, except some animals are more equal than others. Um, you know, our emergency is important and our emergency is more important than your emergency. That's right. Well, although, although it's, it's, um, I, I think that would be the argument, but, um, uh, but I think the counter argument is, is what you just said. And that is, well, look, you know, the counties have the same emergency and they need to, uh, and, and they're closer to the people who are sick. Right. I mean, not, not, it's not just, you know, one state, uh, arching over everybody, but it's, it's, uh, you know, local governments, you know, dealing with local people. Where, where are you, you know, cutting them off at the knees? Well, Tom, we, you know, we talked about this before, and maybe I'm forgetting, but um, has anybody filed a lawsuit here to question his interpretation of the emergency proclamation statute that enables him ostensibly to do this? Has anybody gone to the courts? Has this yes. issue been visited by the Supreme Court? And what happened? There was one case, I think, that went to um, Judge DeWeese on the Big Island. Uh, and um, uh, it, it was uh, somebody who I think was in uh, was cited for violating the emergency you know, proclamation law, and then the uh, the uh, the defense argument was, well, you know, uh, this is invalid because the proclamation should have should have gone for no longer than sixty days, and this and this you know chain. Um, uh, chain proclamation deal is, uh, is, is not right. And, uh, and, and the judge said, well, uh, no, I'll, it's still an emergency, so I'll allow it to proceed. And, and it was never appealed. Hmm. Never went to Supreme Court. You know, it strikes me though, that if you have um, virus number one um, and he does stuff, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're in virus number two, um, that's a that's a more threatening emergency. I mean, by virtue of the numbers, and here we are on the threshold of virus number three. That could be, although it's not clear quite yet. Um, number three could be even a more threatening emergency. It's a new emergency. It's a new emergency for Delta. It's a new emergency for Omicron, isn't it? Because these are different viruses with different characteristics and different threats. Uh, would you allow him? to issue another proclamation for another more threatening virus? Uh, I, I think that's that's appropriate. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you have flood number one and then uh, hurricane number two, uh, you don't you don't question that the governor gets to do two different proclamations, even even though they're like less than 60 days apart. Um, you know, I think this would be a good time to uh, wrestle with some of the questions that were submitted, a number of them were submitted before the show. Uh, I'll read them to you and you can see what you will do with them. Was the single party dominance in Hawaii politics what allowed the governor to have his way? What fa what, what, how much does that factor play in all of this? Um, I, I think very little actually. Uh, most states do have emergency power statutes. Uh, we have uh, one that I think is typical of other states in the nation. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a red state, blue state. I mean, they all have uh, provisions that allow the governor to do certain things in case of an emergency. Uh, and that's, I, I think, appropriate, especially where, you know, uh, like how we have here, the legislature or other parts of government uh, are, not in, uh, are not in session all the time. Okay. Somebody's got to mind the store even when uh, other parts of government are, are in recess. Okay, here's one that we, you know, touched on a minute ago, although we didn't really delve into it. Um, <clears throat> this question is when such powers, the emergency powers, um, allow the governor to lock down the judicial branch, uh, how do we test constitutional constitutionality? That's an interesting question. Let's assume that the, uh, the emergency results in a lockdown of the courts. How well, can that, you that, test that, that really hasn't happened. And, and I don't think uh, it would be constitutional if it, if it was attempted. I mean, we were, um, our constitution definitely provides for uh, three equal branches of government. And, and if the governor says, okay, if, uh, uh, from this day forward, you know the, the the courts are now shut. I, I don't think the courts would 
take that to lying down. No, but you know, it's a funny thing is that as a practical matter, as a logistical matter, it was the state judiciary that closed the courts um, last year for a time. Um, and I really well, they, they closed that... they closed the courts to in person visits, like a number of state buildings were closed to in person visits. Uh -huh. But the but the uh, the business kept moving on. I mean, uh, I'm I'm a practicing attorney, and I've um, had a number of hearings in the courts via Zoom, just like the, how we're doing now. And uh, the business the business goes on. Matter of fact, in the emergency power statute, uh, it does have a procedure to test the validity of emergency power or you know proclamations. You you, you go to the court, um, and you get a three judge panel convened, and you take your complaint to them. Okay. Yeah. Well, even if the courts were shut down, either by the governor or by the state judiciary. The state judiciary could open it up again. It runs the courts. It could impanel that three. That it could impanel the three judge panel you mentioned. It could take it at, at any level. Um, so I, I don't think there's really a legitimate concern on that. It could be, would be tested by the judiciary somehow. I mean, if there was a suit, and if the what do you want to call it, the chief justice, the administrators in the court felt that there was um, that it was a worthy um, constitutional issue at the time. Let's go on to the third question, which is the longest one. Um, here the individual sort of reveals a little about himself. He says, <clears throat> last year I challenged the leadership of the State Department of Defense uh, if they were prepared to disobey, disobey an illegal order if they were going to have to wait for the courts to decide if it was constitutional, they didn't have an answer. What's your answer? Do you understand the question, Tom? Oh yeah. Um, and I, I think you know it's a dilemma for you know most people who are in executive exec, executive branch agencies. Um, the I think the short version of the answer is. If you're running an agency, the governor tells you to do something, um, you do it. And uh, wait for the courts later to tell you, you know, whether what you do is constitutional or not. Because uh, you, as an executive agency, you really don't have the power to decide the constitutionality of your own powers. And there, and there are court cases saying that. So, um, well, let, but let's take some of the things that have happened during the Trump administration. Um, if you or I were asked to do something that we felt was flat out illegal, <clears throat> you know, a demand, for example, to Raffensperger in Georgia to find votes, um, we could say, look, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And I'm, no, I'm and, and, and I think the there comes power. a point, yeah. there comes a point. Uh, uh, where even though you know the you know the, the court said you know you you have no power to declare your own stuff unconstitutional, I, I think it's at some point an executive uh, an executive agency head uh, will say, look, I can't do this. It, it just it just kind of uh, goes past the line of morality or common sense or and 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 the administrator would just say, no, we can't do this. Yeah. Yeah, I, that hasn't happened here, but, uh, I, but you know, that's, that's an issue that has happened and may happen again. So, um, okay, so what is your answer then to the question about this, this challenge? Um, you know, would you have to wait? Well, we kind of answered this already, I think. Would you have to wait um, before the courts could rule? And what could you do if you felt that the order, the proclamation, the emergency proclamation was wrong, like Raffensperger in the case of Trump asking him for votes? Um, you would say, no, I'm sorry. You'd probably want to document that. Yeah. And you would know that your career is on the line. 
um, because you wouldn't you wouldn't be um, in good graces anymore, having denied uh, an order, arguably lawful or unlawful, um, and um, you you know you would you would take that position. However, well, in but, the state of Hawaii, the, that the... is not likely to happen. Well, in Raffensperger's situation, remember the, the request was coming not from his own governor, right? But but from the president of the US, who is not his boss. Right. Right. Crossing the line. Yeah. You know, one thing that um that you raised uh, you know, in preparation for this show, which I find very interesting and provocative, is that the legislature in 2022 um contemplates legislation that would amend the emergency proclamation statute under which David Ige has operated here for the past couple of years. And, you know, we, we spoke before about two kinds, two kinds of things on the table, you know, one, um, you know, where the public safety, the public health is directly affected or indirectly affected. And the other is where, he, you know, he takes a meat ax to a, a whole chapter or agency in, in government. Um, so the question is, what can the legislature do that would be appropriate, that wouldn't be a meat axe itself? How can they tune this thing up? What do you think? Well, last year, <laughs> there was uh, legislation that almost made it through that would have given the legislature um, <clears throat> some uh, veto power, disapproval power over all are part of an emergency proclamation. Um, and, and I think it's healthy to have checks and balances. You, you, need, you basically need all three functioning uh, in order to have the, the kind of government that our, uh, our founders contemplated. So um, <clears throat> the, 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 I think the part that's really unsettling about a, uh, an emergency proclamation uh, is that the legislature really can't do anything about it. So, so, so I think it's, it's right for the legislature to reassert itself and say, okay, uh, if this goes on you know, past a certain point, um, you know, we, the legislature, are going to step in and do something about it. Because, and because you got to remember, the legislature is the, is the body that gave these emergency powers to the governor in the first place. The emergency power statute is a statute. It's chapter 127A of the Hawaii Revised Statutes. <clears throat> so what the legislature giveth, it can taketh away. Oh, sure. I mean, they can repeal the whole thing. That's they right. Can. So the question is, uh, what can they do now? You know, we do have Omicron and we have the possibility of other horrible things, uh, catastrophes left and right, for example, uh, extreme weather that would be a huge emergency and you know for me i would want the governor to have the power to do that whoever the governor is i would want him to have the power to, to save the society in the case of an emergency like extreme weather and other climate change uh, impacts so how do you you have to look around the corner on this you have to imagine what those emergencies could be and you have to do some real drafting, some real lawyering uh, to make the statute resilient in the face of what could be true emergencies that we may not be able to predict exactly. Uh, we don't want him to be stuck because that would affect everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, he, the governor's response uh, was, hey, I would say this, virtually every single state that tied the governor's hands has regretted it. He said that in a Star Advertiser interview. I saw that. And, and, and um, I have no problem with that. Uh, again, uh, the governor, I think, should have emergency powers, as long as they're related to the emergency. Um, I, I, I don't think they should be immune from further review. Uh, I think it's entirely appropriate that the, that the courts have uh, the ability to check uh, to check and balance uh, the constitutionality of, of emergency proclamations or consistency with the emergency power statute, uh, which, which, and, and there really hasn't been a good test so far. Um, 
And I think it's also appropriate that the legislature should have some say uh, on you know, proclamations that go past a certain point in time. Well, um, let's get to that as a second question. The first question is, yes, um, we can test his actions under a proclamation, emergency proclamation through the courts. And that to me would be the first line of evaluation through the courts. But the problem is, <clears throat> the, I would say, this, without, without knowing too much about it, you know more about it, I would say that it has to be driven off the language in that statute. So what is an emergency has to be defined. And uh, his powers in the event of an emergency, they have to be defined. I mean, I'm, I'm nervous about him having the power to um, knock off a whole chapter in, in the Hawaii Revised Statutes. I mean, they could say, for example, if, if you want to uh, suppress a given existing statute and because there's an emergency, how about telling us exactly what provision concerns you and why? So that, um, you know, concerned citizens can make an appeal to the courts on that. Uh, I don't think the right. statute and, and does the, that. And the, um, uh, that played out, I think, in a, in a couple of weeks ago or, or, or four weeks ago when we talked about uh, the Department of Education and how it was responding to um, you know, the, the, the vaccination mandates uh, that the um, uh, governor had put in the emergency proclamation uh, and the HSTA's uh, at you know, a request to to bargain over them. I mean that that in that show, remember, uh, we we brought up the fact that the DOE basically said, "Look, talk to the hand." Yeah, because because the emergency proclamation says this, you have no right to collective bargain because that law has been suspended, et cetera, et cetera. That's that's not what I think the emergency power statute is all about. Well. Um, and then, then you go to the question of what uh, the legislature is saying. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We don't. We don't like the um, you know the duration of this proclamation. It's too long, and we don't. We don't believe that the renewal of the proclamation uh, is appropriate in the circumstances. If you do that, Tom, don't you agree with me? You're making the legislature into a court, and you're undermining the, the power of the courts in a way uh, to you know to. Um, interpret uh, the actions of of the governor, um, well, and you're also let's... you're also undermining the governor. I would I would say that if the legislature doesn't like something, um, it should be dealing with the whole statute, not just saying, "Well, this extension was wrong," or "That particular action was wrong." That makes it into a court. And frankly, I would not feel good about having the legislature act as a court. It's not set up to do that, and I cannot imagine how it could do it effectively. Right. Well, the, the courts are set up to uh, uh, to make judgments on uh, legal standards that have already been set up. Legislatures are better set up to make policy choices, and that's what that's what they do all the time. So, uh, if you're asking whether a particular action that the governor has um, proposed or has implemented uh, is constitutional or not? I think I think that's still a uh, it's still a uh, a court's or the judiciary's job to make that determination. Uh, but I think you still have to um, have a policy based review. I mean, is is it or is it not a good idea to to entirely suspend the collective bargaining law? For example, well, uh, yeah. Let's go to that, and let's return to my my friend at Long's. Um, to me, uh, we are talking about life and death, and we are talking about public health and disease, uh, where we read in the paper about all these people who die, and over time, you know, something close to ninety thousand people in the state have contracted the disease. And I can't tell you the total number who have died, but it's substantial. And it, it may well be substantial again in the future. So when it comes to vaccine mandates, 
when it comes to saying we're not we're not going to do the ordinary thing here because why because people are dying or at risk of dying um unless i can see a really good reason um to allow the um, collective bargaining provisions to stay in effect i would say the governor can have his way i want him to save lives and and so how many lives do i have to give up because the union wants collective bargaining so I, we may differ on this um but my view is that we we have lost our sensitivity um to death to people dying in the country there are almost 800,000 people can you imagine if there was an event in Mo Moili Ili where five people were killed it would be all over the front page and everybody would be horrified how about 800,000 I think we have to take draconian steps to stop that from further increase and if that means the union has to stand aside I would say stand aside man this is a job for the governor who is watching it with his immediate staff I I understand we might not agree but there are a lot of people like the one I met in Longs right and and I think that's uh uh a very good point to end on we've we we have uh certainly uh various approaches to the issue uh I I do think uh that policy-based review of emergency proclamations uh, is necessary and appropriate um whether that's going to overturn individual decisions um uh, that that I think you're right that that's more of a a, a court thing that the judiciary is better equipped to handle so there really should be some limits on what uh, the legislature can approve or disapprove in the name of reviewing an emergency order um, but uh, I think that's what we can look forward to in the 2022 legislature because uh, hopefully there will be provisions uh, that that are drafted and circulate and and that we the public get to comment on uh, and there will be no gut and replace. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, this is, this is an important issue. There's no question about it. Uh, we will have uh, emergencies going forward. Uh, sorry to, to sorry to say. Uh, thank you very much for raising the issue, Tom, and discussing it. Uh, and thanks to our listener uh, who submitted those questions. We always appreciate questions from our viewers. Uh, Tom Yamachika, President of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Thank you so much, Tom. Aloha, Jake. Aloha.